Steve Rossi, uh, guilty as charged. For a long time, I didn't uh, want to... I don't want to title this. I don't like the word podcast. I didn't like it in 2006 when I started doing them. I just thought I'd say guilty as charged because it came out of my mouth and that it wouldn't be the title and I would never refer to what it meant and just laugh to myself just saying something that meant nothing. But now I figure if I'm going to do these as much as I have been, I should probably put them on a podcast site and give it a title. But uh, we'll, we'll, I'll think of a title. I could just call it my last name, but or just say Rossi Talk, but no one knows talk means funny. I just don't want to... Everyone on... Hash, new podcast, new podcast. I've been doing this since Ricky Gervais. You know, everyone's obsessed with going to the comedy club every single night. You have to get on stage every night. You just have to do it. Just like when I played piano through all my childhood until I was in college, you have to practice every single day. You have to do stand-up comedy. But there is some sort of almost... They fetishize this hanging out and just being there and repeating the same things where there are other ways to go about doing things. I'm not denigrating that way, and I've done that way, and I want to do that way. My whole goal is to get back to New York City so I can just hit the clubs every night. But um, I started doing this in 2006 and found that it helped generate material. But also, I was working on Monta Williams' show, and then for him personally, I couldn't do the stage time I wanted. And, and um, so I just started going, and once I started showering in a shower, I'm like, well, now I have carte blanche to use the office and all the recording equipment. And so I just started recording things with all these sound effects and jingles and thousands of television, just, uh, I had tools at my, uh, disposal. And so I would just try to have a lot of fun doing that. Now I'm actually just trying to record things that actually mean something to me. Some of them are obviously silly, but that Scott Peterson stuff really meant something to me. But none of this is funny. None of this is funny. This is what I'm saying. If I was in an audience, I'd be like, get off, all off, no, no, no. I'm like a cat wanting to get inside. Get that. I can't even stand listening to myself one more second. I have a very high self-awareness, and I'll, I'll often apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doing that. I have people that tell me constantly, stop apologizing. Stop apologizing for being yourself. My cousin Amber, she hangs up on me every time I say I'm sorry. Why do I apologize for being myself? Because you got to be funny. You can't just press record or get on a stage and not be funny. That, you know, I could see someone trying to get there and stuff, but when someone just consistently is not funny and it's abhorrent and, ugh, yeah, I know what I'm not funny and I, there's sets that I, I'll get up in the shower even when I am funny and I'll just, ugh, I'll groan. I heard Bill Burr used to do that. When I heard Bill Burr say that, he used to get up after sets and just groan in the shower. Ugh. I do, I used to do that. When I heard that, I'm like, oh my God, I do the same thing. Even after doing well, I just can't believe I told an audience that. But that was more in my 20s. Now I go out of my way to tell everything and just 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 totally um i've been influenced by a lot of great comics my whole life i'm as much of a fan of comedy as i am any a thing in life i'm a fan of short for fanatic you know i call me a, a fan of the nfl in some ways but i am a comedy fanatic and i uh, i really believe when people say talk about putting their ten thousand hours whether it be michael jordan or people have to put in ten thousand hours to something i don't i don't know what the number is but um but I do believe listening and studying comedy is all part of that and uh, really sinking your teeth into something and not just watching a comedy show and not just saying, I'm going to put on an episode of this and that's part of it. But if you really, really sink your teeth in. And, uh, I, I would say the comics I studied most this year are uh, uh, Colin Quinn, for sure, and uh, before that was Patrice. And these are all guys I loved before, but um, Jim Norton was a guy who really... When I heard Jim Norton... Um, and sometimes it could, oh, I thought you could be a shtick someone's being so openly honest. Jim Norton is so brass tacks honest, and for better or worse, there's no shame there. And um, well, maybe there is, you know, I can't speak to his shame, but uh, I just think he's a fantastic example of, of a comedian. He's a fan of comedy. Nothing about Norton is phony, and I like that a lot. And uh, um, he's just a guy I look to as, uh, he's one of the beacons of comedy, you know. He's not my specific, like, I don't know all these Jim Norton specials. I know Norton on Opie Anthony and Tough Crowd and a lot of, I know Norton, th tons of interviews. But it's, I don't always tune into comedian specials in general. I listen, I want to know the story behind the comic, always. I always wanted to know the story behind the comic, not the stand-up material. You know, uh, I want to know how they got that way. And that's what Jim Norton helps do to me. That's what Ron Bennington and Unmasked do. They, they strip away and help you figure out if you even should be a comic or why you would be. And, and that's brilliant, brilliant stuff that I feeds my soul. 
when I started hearing that unmasked stuff years ago, and even when I tuned into WTF and first heard those Chris Rock and Stephen Wright things, I used to think like it was a, it was act. I would treat it like it was a movie that had, I'd been waiting for for years. I would get like my favorite drink like on a Sunday night, and I'd really just chill, and I would focus everything into that interview with Stephen Wright or whoever it was, and I would just you know I just I loved it, and I love what these guys do, and. Um, that's what I want to be. My goal in life, you know, if you, what's your goals in life? Well, you, they'll, I'm sure they'll always change, you know. When Jim Carrey wrote himself a check for $10 million, it wasn't about he wanted to have $10 million. It was just about a, that's what his success would dictate as an actor by that time. You know, but when I think of, well, all I want to do is, honestly, without corn bullshit, I just want to be the funniest comic in any room I go into. I want to be as funny as the funniest, and I want to be the funniest. I'm not going to be modest there. I want to be the funniest comic every room I walk into. Um, comic is a different term than a person. I believe I am the funniest person that of any room I walk into. I at least I have the potential to be. Uh, but I want to be the best comic, the best stand-up comic I can be. Well, that's it. I mean, my old goal used to be to sit at that table at the cellar. I wanted that Seinfeld 2001 comedian documentary came out. I was a junior in college. I watched that thing every day around the clock with and without the commentary. With the commentary was Seinfeld and Colin Quinn. And, uh, I used to just write to the main screen with the lights and the soft music in the background. I wouldn't face the TV. I would just have the music on. But I knew every line of that movie, every everything. And then a year later, I was going to graduate college. I just graduated college and nothing, didn't know what I was going to do. I just wanted to do comedy. I was landscaping and I got this job for Montel. And then suddenly I go to the cellar and I'm sitting in the exact same booth at the, that I've been watching in a movie I, every day for a year. And now I'm sitting in that booth. And uh, there's a comedian's table in the background, and I have a story about that, about sitting there, because a comic forced me to, Eric Rivera forced me to, and then I got ripped apart by Patrice O'Neill for sitting there. It was the best time of my life, but uh, this is seven minutes, and I might as well save if I'm going to start talking about that to it for another time. But that used to be my only goal, sit at that, to be able to sit at that table. And I would still say that's the goal, but to, you know, to put out albums, to sit on that table... Uh, every night, and uh, but you know, I used to picture that table as just the Norton Geraldo Patrice. I for you know, as a twenty year old, I didn't realize how much comedy quickly evolves and people work the road and stuff. I in my head as a twenty year old, I just pictured uh, you know Keith and Rich, and I've seen a couple of those guys. There are a lot actually. I talked to over Kelly there, and but I just uh, I love Tough Crowd, obviously best show ever uh, to be taken off the air, um, one of the best shows ever made. Uh, Nick DiPaolo too. All those guys, fantastic. They're like superheroes. They're like a superhero team for me. And I was always turned off by comedy when I was younger that was mean in any way. I really loved, really, truly, my, my guys were Mitch Hedberg, George Carlin, Don Knotts. Um, they were all nice guys. Larry David, and his was always sort of fighting for a better purpose, even if he was rude. You know, and then I heard these guys like Nick D and uh, Rich Voss and all these people. I was even in a movie with Rich Voss. He was in that Stand Up 360 movie I talked about, which I still can't believe I forgot he was in that. But these guys were uh, the first guys that were, uh, they had this, they could be savage, and I always still like them. They could be brutal, and these guys just had a way, and they're, uh, they're a dream team of, the, uh, of comedy. That's what I would like to be a part of. So if you're seeing, wondering why I'm doing this, it's because I have to. I'm cornered because I don't have stage time, you know. My, I don't have a set till January 28th. And it's a good show here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. But today's the 18th or something, 17th. And uh, that's unacceptable. And uh, so i got to do what I have to do. People, actors, and Jim Carrey, they say, well, I would've, I would, I'll do this job for, uh, if, you know, if I was making no money, I'd still be doing it. Well, would you? Because you get, you get family and stuff. Like, I'm making no money doing this, and I am doing it. So... If I say twenty years, ten years from now, if, however long when I'm if, when I'm successful by uh, whatever definition, and I say, well, I would be doing this for no money. I say, well, I did that for no money, and all comics do. I'm not trying to say, hey, I'm some renegade asshole, but uh, I'm just gonna keep recording these, and I hope there's funny stuff throughout that brings people back. This isn't my funniest one, but uh, kind of thought I should explain some stuff. And this is ten minutes. This is just uh, bullshit.